It's a record button. Very good. Okay. So um, uh, what I suggested with regard to topic is that we go through the agenda and talk about all the CES relevant things other than CES. Ah. So, let, so let us proceed to scroll through the agenda until we get to technical all right. items. All right, here are technical items. Okay, so update on realms. Uh, I would uh, group into the same category as CES yep. with regard to what I meant. Um, Unicode properties, uh, I am hoping that there is no CES relevance because I've not been paying attention to all things Unicode. Right. Everything, I wish there, I, mean, I repeat my desire to have everything to do with Unicode internationalization, um, dates, times, or regular expressions fobbed off on a separate committee. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it's, so the internationalization is subbed off on that a separate committee. That is true. We can still spend a lot of time talking but about I, it. But I think it's extremely important that it doesn't... Oh, it's important that it be done right. No, it's important that it go through TC39 consensus before it becomes official. Sure. Because otherwise we will catch even fewer security horrors than we've been catching. We already have, um, due to my inattention, we already let several through. Okay. So you want to talk about? So what is async initialization? Uh, Bradley, are you on? Sure. Um, so async initialization is just, there is a problem where classes in JavaScript can not <clears throat> accurately handle uh, a constructor that returns a promise. So something that is not initialized synchronously, um, such as not being able to fully initialize mm. all of its fields safely, can't actually install class properties or class fields properly since they install the fields on the promise of the super constructor rather than on the instance that's wrapped by a promise. Well, watch out, watch out, cable. So if you were, for example, to have something like remote object as a class and remote object uh, really is creating promises, but trying to use class features like class fields and particularly private fields, um, you can't really do so today. There are ways to do it, but they are extremely weird to do. So that's it. I'm just stating the committee should look into fixing this. You have a, is there a proposal at the other end of that link? Uh, not really. Okay. Um, it's similar to what I did with private declarations. I'm just bringing up the topic because we are moving forward with various designs in the committee, but we are not um, having ways to eventually clean up the mess we're making as we go. Okay, uh, so this is definitely relevant and interesting to us. Um, do you have thoughts towards a proposal? Um, in general, I think we have to alter how super works for these kinds of special classes, which is unfortunate. Um, basically, the problem is the way that fields were proposed and shipped they work on the result of the super constructor. Yep. So if your super constructor returns a promise because yep. it's asynchronously initializing something, you install the private fields on the promise, not on the value the promise resolves to. Yeah, that's correct. And we need to have a way to tell the class that we don't want to operate on the oh. value returned by super, but we want to operate on what was wrapped by super. Are you thinking of putting in a wait in front of the super call? Uh, we can't do that. That's already possible. Um, <laughs> we have to introduce potentially something like super dot await, which is hideous. But why, why can't you do uh, a await super? Because you will still perform the field initialization on the promise, not on the instance. 
and await super is valid syntax currently. I see, I see, I see. Um, uh, if we change the meaning of await super, uh, now that you can't do that because it's just a composition of existing things. Okay. Um, okay. Is the semantics, what is the semantics that I'm thinking of for await super, which is that the, the constructor uh, is now, the, the, the continuation of the constructor uh, waits for the promise returned by super to become fulfilled and then only binds this to the fulfillment and then proceeds with the constructor. Uh, that is my inkling, but I do not have a concrete proposal. I'm open to alternatives. Okay, so, so if we've got a semantics that seems sensible and, and kind of know where we would put it, then the syntax design, even though I don't have a concrete suggestion either, seems solvable. Uh, I would agree. This is just about how various class features no longer are able to work with one of our built-in container types, which is promise. So your, your concrete suggestion that that's not currently accepted was super dot weight? Uh, Kevin Gibbons mentioned that in IRC, and I think. Can I, uh, can I ask a question? Yep. Uh, because a super dot await, um, it kind of implies that you can't have a property called await um, right. on, the, right. on the static um, declaration for super. Uh, or I can't remember what, what super um, dot directly, I, I guess it's prototype, right? So it's still- Yeah, you're, right. yeah uh, Saul, yeah. You're, you're, you're correct. Super dot await has the same problem as the previous suggestion, which is it's, it's not currently a syntax error. It currently has a meaning and the meaning naturally follows from the combination of the meanings of the, of the, uh, of the components. But, but, but there is one thing about the, word, the keyword super um, um, being used anywhere other than the initialization in the constructor um, is, uh, so, so, so it, the super open bracket notation is only ever going to appear once in a class. Um, mm, it can appear multiple times within a constructor function. Oh. Um, do, I, do you mean open, open when you said open bracket? I'm sorry, uh, Sal, just a just point of clarification. When yeah. You said super, super open bracket. Which bracket did you mean? Oh, uh, there needs to be a call, direct call to the super uh, inside the constructor that extends. And so you meant open class so, extending yeah. whatever has to call super one time. Did you, did you mean square bracket or left parentheses? No, parentheses. Uh, I, they're all okay. brackets in my world. Okay, that's what, that's what I was asking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, round bracket call to super that is needed in any class extends, um, if, a, if a class returns um, a value other than, you know, the the actual class at some point i remember this was uh, considered a um you know it's it, it was considered um at least bad practice for a class so we would say if there's an async constructor as a special um a new syntax um for classes that that returns an awaitable um um you know, undefined maybe even at that point. Um, and the awaitable undefined just says as soon as that um, await um, resumes, um, then the initialized this gets initialized by the prototype of this class, not the, the one it extends. It is, you know, unless I, um, sorry, I, I completely glossed over when you said, Bradley, that you can have multiple super, super calls. Um, is it a common practice or is it just by design? Uh, it is by design. They can be uh, recalled if there is a failed super call by a throw, or they could be within different branches of flow control. 
but only one of them can be can execute successfully. Correct. Okay. Um, you can call it a second time after the first, but it will throw already initialized. Right, okay. Um, yeah. The super override trick that you're talking about is in active use in the wild due to how yeah. fields initialize. So I doubt we can change its behavior. We definitely cannot change its behavior. And I will go ahead and be on the record as saying it's one of my big regrets in the class design is that we allowed the super override feature and has caused us nothing but pain. And I think it has not been worth the minor utility it provides. Um, how, how is the super override? Like, well, what do you mean when you say that? Returning a object not uh, initialized by your super class. So uh, what people are doing is they create a class that has private fields on it. Private fields then call out to what the extends class heritage is, and that can be a function. And the function returns any object they want to install the private field fields on. And this is in the wild. Um, it yeah. is likely to be able to be changed. This was intentional by the private fields proposal. Uh, no, it predates private fields. I mean, private fields leveraged it to continue to, to initialize that thing. But super override was part of classes preceding private fields. The private fields didn't have any choice. Yeah, the, 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 the fault is the ES6 maximally minimal class design and super override is certainly outside the maximally minimal design restriction we were allegedly operating under. Um, uh, but it was that whatever that thing returns, that becomes bound to this in the subconstructor. Uh, that is the the what what the this is initialized to the subconstructor. This is in temporal dead zone prior to that initialization, uh, which is why this thing you know only why only one super call can execute successfully, um, and um, uh, so so yeah the. It, yeah we. We talked ourselves into the flexibility of being able to call something as a super constructor and have it return an object of its choosing. Somehow we talked ourselves into that being an attractive degree of flexibility. And I just completely regret it. But it, I completely agree that we can't back out of it. It's been there long enough and enough people know about it. Uh, we cannot we cannot change that. Um, uh, if it uh, so super dot await is existing syntax, so we can't change the meaning of it. Await dot super. I mean, I'm just reaching here. I'm not saying that we should take whatever the first syntax we come up with. It's not that's currently a syntax error, but just to 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 sanity check. Await dot super. Um, uh, you can't say await dot something, as far as I, I can tell. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm actually not sure of that. So there, there's, a, there's a, um, a case for the fact that today you cannot write async, uh, sorry, uh, async constructor. It's invalid syntax. So if you add the word async before the function constructor in a class, that's a syntax error. So nobody played around with that. You could add a, con a criteria that you're only allowed to ever return without return value because it always has to return this. But some people might use the return in the constructor as a as a control like like control um, expression like don't continue the the rest of the function. Um, so allowing only a bare return without a particular value so that it would always default to returning this um, now um, as soon as this is an, a, is uh, an async constructor uh, it should always be extended by an async constructor could be another constraint uh, uh, 
I, I, I didn't understand something you said there, or rather, I did understand something you said there, but I didn't understand how it conflicts with something that Bradley said. Uh, I, I, I was having the same thought, which is that you can only use um, a weight in front of a in, in front of something in an async function, and you, since you can't declare an async constructor, Bradley, you said this is being used by some people. How is no 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 return, return overrides being used? No, no, the, the, he said a weight super was actually a thing that people did. No. Um, so you uh, maybe I misheard. Do it. And sometimes if you extend promise, you see people doing things like this. How can you express this syntactically? So, yeah, since you can't say async constructor, you can't say a weight super. But you can call super from within a closure declared within your constructor. Yeah, can uh, you? Oh, shit. Really? Are you sure? Really? I didn't check, but I remember this from Adam's slides a while ago. So, so super um, uh, open round bracket in the constructor function evaluates to this once it's done. And oh. the word await is really await yourself. I, I, again, I'm, I'm just like shooting just based on how I used it. Uh, so uh, I, I know for a fact that um, super round bracket, whatever, gave me access to this, the first, um, the, the earliest time I could, you know, just call okay. something from this. Um, I, could, I could verify before uh, we, you know, make that leap. So I'm just doing that quickly. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, for the uh, interest of uh, coverage of lots of stuff before the meeting, uh, I, I'd say um, uh, let's put this aside for now. Uh, preserve the host virtualizability uh, is definitely CES relevant. Uh, it's basically a, a pitch to not break the features of the language that makes SES possible, uh, uh, but also to identify the ways, in, um, to identify the current ways in which the language delegates semantics to the host. And uh, to, uh, to say that what we need is all of those things, we need to enable JavaScript code to act as virtual host to other JavaScript code through hooks in either the compartment API, if it's an evaluator, if it's an, if it's about what happens during evaluation, or hooks in the Realm API, if it's about the set of intrinsics that constitute Realm, or in the agent API, which we don't have yet, uh, but basically different things that different semantics that are provided by the host are provided over different granularities of computation, uh, and how you reify them as hooks depends on what granularity they're relevant to. So the, the, the example uh, would be that um, uh, control of the promise queue and control of the job scheduling, you know, introduction of another job queue and then, and then how that job queue is scheduled compared to other job queues. Um, uh, that's something where one could imagine an agent API that does for agents what the Realm API does for realms, that an agent API would allow you to provide uh, hooks by which the agent creator could determine the scheduling policy for the created agent. Uh, and something that uh, Peter Hadi um, uh, Monopole uh, noticed is that uh, sometimes when he explains the whole CES thing to people, uh, there are some people that really respond to the security as a motivating uh, issue um, and are, are, you know, we do not respond to virtualizability. And then there's a bunch of other software engineers for which it's exactly the other way around. Virtualizability is really cool because it lets you emulate hosts and do dependency injection and just all of this um, you know, power of virtualization. And they don't really respond to security. But as Peter Hadi observed, 
in order to really get virtualization right, you can motivate everything we need from security as something needed in order to get virtualization right, which I, I think is an interesting observation. I think I think the the you know these two phrases is preserve host virtualizability. Is, if I understand correctly, your, your proposal it's which I, I read through in detail last time around, but um, we didn't get to it, which is why it's on the overflow list. Um, it's like, we have observed the following way in which the spec is not broken. Let us now commit to actually explicitly saying we will not break it in this, in this way going forward. Yes. Yes, that's the main emphasis. It's not so much on fixing the virtualizability so that it's perfect, although that is an emphasis. Uh, but the main emphasis is that JavaScript is really pretty damn virtualizable right now. That's what makes SES possible. Uh, and the and, and it happened by accident. And the only way we've preserved it over the last 10 years is hypervigilance. And we've let a few flaws slip through, even with hypervigilance. And the problem is we've never explained to the rest of the committee what invariant it is that they need to not break. We've just tried to catch it when they break it. And that's not a good situation. How much other stuff does the spec have which are sort of sort of meta specification? Very, very little, but not zero. Um, the, uh, actually, let me make sure I understand what you mean by meta specification. Meaning, meaning what we're proposing is, is this is not a, a, a spec for the language, this is a spec for the spec. Okay. So, um, uh, so the, the best example is what I called the object invariance, which are things like if an object claims to be frozen, it cannot then appear to have new own properties that it did not previously appear to have, or that it changes the configurability of the own properties that it has. And basically, once it appears to be frozen, it has to obey, uh, it cannot violate the implications of that. And uh, what, that, what that does, having that in there, uh, is first of all, it's an obligation on host, host objects. That hosts, when they introduce host objects, uh, they may not introduce a host object that violates the object invariance. If they do, then the JavaScript system containing that host object is not in conformance to the spec. Right. Once again, that's a constraint on implementations. No, 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 the, so okay, let, me get, let, me, let me give the other example, and then you'll see how it serves uh, both purposes. Um, actually, let me give two other examples. The, um, uh, the one that most directly is like what you're saying is, if somebody proposed a new object um, in the spec, a spec, a spec created object like uh, I think we actually face this with the na module namespace exotic object. Uh, the module namespace exotic object, uh, if it were proposed that its behavior is that it has a property that it claims is non-configurable, but which the exporting module can change um, uh, in a way that violates the claimed non-configurability, that uh, before we introduce the object invariance, that would just be that they had violated an invariant that other people in the committee were guarding but had not explained. With the object invariance there, that becomes an inconsistency between two parts of the spec. I see. So, and then so Mark, uh, Mark, a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, is it do you think that we should expand this proposal to also touch on uh, internal slots? Uh, which, sorry, which proposal? Uh, I, I came in late, so sorry, might not have the yeah. right context. I, I thought yeah. you were talking about the proposal to try to um, avoid uh, introductions of new APIs from the DOM and from the language itself that might uh, make it even harder for us to do any any virtualization. Right. So that so 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 you got it right. That is what we're talking about. 
Uh, we're, we're, um, we're going through the spec and we were on the item preserve host virtualizability. Going through the agenda. Going through the agenda. So what did I say? You said spec. Oh, sorry, going through the agenda. Uh, and we were on the item preserve host virtualizability. Uh, and I was trying to explain what I have in mind there. Uh, and yeah, when try, what I want to do is write down all of the ways, first of all, write down all of the ways in which JavaScript succeeds at being virtualizable now, adopt them normatively as a constraint on how the spec evolves going forward so we don't lose the virtualizability we have. But also, in addition, the secondary thing that's part of, this, part of that same item uh, is to identify the ways in which uh, we don't have perfect virtualizability now and to try to fix as many of those as we can. For example, identifying host hooks and turning them into either um, compartment hooks or realm hooks or agent hooks, depending on what the host hook is about. Uh, and then by turning it into a hook in an API, allow JavaScript code to act as host to other JavaScript code. So those are the two right. main things there. Uh, Chip was asking about to what degree we have meta constraints already in the spec. And I was saying the object invariants are the existing right. precedent where something else introduced to the spec could violate them, in which case the spec itself is in an inconsistent state. That, that's a little bit different. There's sort of a the meta spec here is don't introduce inconsistencies, um, which seems pretty uncontroversial. Um, but here we're, we're saying specifically we have this goal which, it, it, which is specifically framed in terms of what future versions of the spec should or should not do. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if there's any precedent for that. Certainly there's precedent in terms of, of the committee's discussions saying, oh, we can't do this because it would violate the principle that we tend to follow, but not, I don't know about anything explicit. Okay, so the, the key thing is that you need, whatever, if, if we're doing a constraint that we must not violate the following abstract property, we need to explain it concretely enough yes. Yes. that other people who aren't particularly interested in that concrete plot property can nevertheless tell whether something they're inter interested in proposing would violate or, or at least have it pointed out to them and have them agree, oh yes, I see. Right, right. Um, and there's many, and, and, and if we had had this 10 years ago, there's many mistakes that could have been avoided. Um, uh, but I'm not sure, um, but like the, the, the object invariance, uh, I mean, in some sense, those are, um, those do fit that description. Um, be, uh, uh, or rather, what they're, what they're accomplishing fits the description, which mm -hmm. is that appearing to be frozen is a commitment of stability. So you can then not act unstable in such a way that, it pre that you had previously committed to act stable. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that, and that language does not appear in the spec. So I suppose what you're asking for is there's no precedent on language like that. Right. A high level goal. Right. So my, my question was was really whether or not uh, these whether or not um, the usage the arbitrary usage of internal slots also compromise the, uh, the virtualizability of the language and we have a long thread discussion you were on it um, on the Promise dot any, I think, was the, the proposal. Yes. So we touch on the internal slot problems that we have today. And I've been thinking about a lot uh, in terms of the implications of that. And, uh, and the more I think about it, the more I believe it's going to make it really, really hard for us to uh, do any membrane implementation or anything like that. Because just becoming just becoming a problem um the the fact that if we can't identify the object that is coming through the membrane and and try to replicate that object just because it has internal slots that if we share 
the the, the same object. Uh, let me let me step back. The fact that we have internal slots that prevent us from uh, preserving the identity across the membrane seems to be a problem. Uh, at least for me, seems to be a problem. Um, I'm not sure how related it is to the virtualization story. And, and I believe it's going to be really, really hard to get rid of those internet slots. But uh, at least maybe look at that from the angle of virtualization saying, is this a problem or not? So I, th I think you're right. And I hadn't actually thought about it connected in that way. Uh, I definitely um, ag you know, agree with you about we need to make it very, very hard to add new internal slots because each one has a substantial cost in non in making membranes not able to be fully transparent. Um, the uh, Dominic uh, had a proposal at one point uh, for the right reason even. Um, uh, that I supported, but nobody else did, that any new internal slots introduced into JavaScript be realm specific. And that would do it. The, the, the thing that's making the, the problem is that, um, uh, is that a you know, date.getFullYear method in realm A given a date instance in realm B, will recognize it as a date instance and get its internal slot. Whereas if it's going through a proxy and it sees a proxy for the date in realm B, it will not. And that's the, that's the case where a, you cannot make a membrane between two realms operate identically to just a realm boundary. And Whoa. I, 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 so the date is an interesting one, but I, I, what about other things like a, like a set or a map or something like that? Um, and I have been thinking about this problem quite some time now. Yeah. And, and I feel that I haven't encountered an actual problem when it comes to having a membrane that separates two realms and there is a, a, a set or a map that is okay. crossing through the membrane. Uh, obviously, we do not want to leak the, the identity of the, of the set, but the functionality of the set should be preserved um, while uh, which is easy in this case, you just put a, 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 a proxy around it and then you can go on a membrane around it and you can interact with that object and get things out of the set and set things into the set and such. Um, the problem is that the identity of the set itself is lost. Uh, so, I, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 that doesn't correspond to my understanding. Um, let me let me step back a second. So we have uh, up to today, we have been mostly thinking about membrane. This is again my perception of the, of the problem. Um, uh, up to today, I was thinking about this problem and saying there are two solutions for this. The two options for 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 sharing a a, a set between two realms. Okay. Option number one is that, well, you are sending a set through uh, the membrane. Somehow you call a function on the other side and then you pass it as an argument. And the membrane does the translation of that into a proxy that you receive on the other end. And okay. that proxy, you can talk to it. You can do all the operations that you normally do. And whether there's distortion or not, let's put that aside. But you right. are effectively receiving a proxy that you can interact with um, in the same fashion that you interact with any set. Right. Uh, and that works pretty well. Uh, yes. And in fact, that's what we use today. The problem mm -hmm. is that the identity of the set um, as a object created off of one of the intrinsics that you have is lost because I will not be able to check 
if the new proxy that I have access to is an instance of set and okay. I will not be able to use any of my prototype, set prototype methods okay. to go and call then onto that object because that object is a proxy of a set from another route. Okay. That's I, I option think, number one. Yeah, I, 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 I think from, that, from your explanation there uh, that I understand what your option two is. Um, so let me see if I can state it uh, and you can tell me if I got it wrong. Um, option two is that you're, tr you're trying to make it seem like um, the, obje the, you know, the, the objects on the other side of the membrane, you're trying to make it seem like we're all in one realm so that instance of works. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, you need to make the proxy for the foreign set actually inherit from the local set dot prototype, but that doesn't work because the local set dot prototype has built in methods that won't recognize your proxy. That's correct. So, uh, so you, my only option is really to make a copy of the set and saying this is not a live set, is a set that is brand new. And that's what we do with the rates. It's the same problem with the rates. Uh, it's just uh, brand so, new. So, so I would say, first of all, that's a really in losing shared mutability. Uh, that, this, is, this is the reason I was confused. When you were talking about the share, the, losing the identity, um, uh, the, um, uh, you're not talking about just object identity for a triple equal test because they're obviously different on the two sides of the membrane. The membrane is identity preserving in the sense of mapping identity to identity. What you're talking about is uh, having a, uh, is making a copy so that, so that you don't have shared mutability. Right. And, okay. and then Justin came up with a solution for this problem where you could achieve both of them. Okay. Um, and that is an interesting proposal. Um, uh, it's not a proposal in a sense of changing the spec, but a way is a, is a workaround for this problem where he proposed that in the inner realm, in the sandbox, we go and patch all the intrinsics that are accessing internal slots of the set in this particular case. And um, uh, patch them with a function that first checks if the instance that is being received is a proxy of a set from another realm. And if it is, then call the same function on that other realm uh, in order to really do the operation properly because it's going to work to, I mean, uh, sorry, it calls the, the, the original functionality with the original uh, uh, set and it will do what it have to do with internal slot, everything works fine. But if it is not a proxy, that means it is a set created by the sandbox itself, then don't, don't do that, just use it directly. It's sort of a unwrapping mechanism inside the yeah. patch method. And you have okay. to go and do it for every method that you, that you encounter that has any access or any method that uses an internal slot. What that gives you is the ability to use the membrane to preserve the identity of the object, uh, also preserve uh, all the mechanics that you use internally in your, in your sandbox to access or to interact with that uh, proxy. Um, uh, and it seems to work. I haven't tested it yet, but it seems like an interesting uh, mm -hmm. approach. Uh, that is interesting. Uh, that for the cases that I'm thinking of, uh, that should generally work. Uh, and it means that even, and, and uh, applying it, uh, and also, um, and think, so for, for maps and sets and dates, where the methods are not generic, uh, that, uh, that's, that is necessary, but once you do that, I think it works. For arrays, interestingly, uh, I don't think you need to copy them because the thing, because in, in um, running through this in my head just now, all of the built-in methods on array are generic. 
they don't they just need something that acts like an array they they don't do they don't access an internal slot uh, so well you, no, no no well the problem with arrays is a different problem i believe and I, I, I might be wrong but the problem with the rates is that obviously the what justin is proposing is a little bit more complicated than what i mentioned because the when you're doing the operation against a proxy so if the, this value is a proxy and you have a way to determine because you're the one patching the, the, the intrinsic in the sandbox um, if the if, if the if the instance is a, is a proxy you have to do extra bit of operations uh, for example if you are adding something to the set you have to wrap that before you set you add it to the set because the set really belongs to the outer realm you don't want to leak an object from the inner realm from the sandbox into the outer realm you have to wrap it and give it as a in my, in my case a reverse proxy as i call it um, similarly if you are getting something out of the set because it is a proxy i need to call it on the original target of that proxy and the original functionality provided by the engine to access the value and then I need to wrap it into a proxy because that's how I preserve the membrane. So the membrane has to do a lot more gymnastics in this case. Uh, uh, let, let me try out a simpler variation that still uh, gets the, I mean, that, that's still using Justin's trick, um, uh, which is, uh, let, uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm going to assume here that the membranes we're concerned about uh, can be embedded with the replacement built-ins so that um, the membrane can register uh, all of its proxies so that these built-in wrappers can ask, is this a proxy? Yeah, yeah, because okay. it's part of the membrane itself. It's a sort of a initialization right. of the realm. Okay, great. So given only is this a proxy, then uh, I claim that a non-generic built-in like uh, set.add, um, uh, that the wrapper could simply say, if it's a proxy, then execute the code, you know, uh, the, the proxy value dot add of, of whatever the arguments are, and you let that invocation go through the membrane. So you actually just do the operation as a normal instance operation on your side of the membrane, and you let the membrane translate the arguments and everything to turn into an operation that looks up add um, uh, uh, the looks up add uh, in the set that prototype on the other side of the membrane um, because we can really because because you're really okay right you're really not no because doing... uh because wait wait because uh, mark that that so the problem there is that we we're trying to set the proto chain of the proxy to match the proto that the proto the prototypes that you have in the sandbox so when you call the proxy dot set you're really calling the same set if you do set the prototype the add or something like that so, so when you you, when you, you see the prototype so go ahead yeah you don't need to do that uh what you can do but we is, don't want to we do, we, we do I, want I, to I, because that then otherwise is observable right no, like no, you... I, I, let, let me suggest a different compromise and i'm not claiming it's unobservable I think all of these things are, are you know, leak some of observ observability around the corner, um, but it's practically unobservable, uh, which is for instance of checks, the proxy can act like it's like it inherits from the local set dot prototype for property lookup purposes. Uh, it can act like it's a, like the proxy inherits for a proxy, from a proxy for, for of the remote set.prototype. So in other words, 
the property lookup is just normal naive membrane semantics as if you did not rewire the inheritance. But for instance of, uh, uh, it does act like you had rewired the inheritance. Okay. Yeah, I, there are a few things that we could do there. I feel that uh, a couple of a couple of things that we need to do on our end. First, we definitely need better terminology for this because we sometimes we talk about identity, sometimes we talk about transparency, and yeah. I, I feel that we, we have gaps to communicate yeah. clearly what what the intent of the membrane is. <clears throat> so hopefully you can help with that. Yeah. Um, the, the the second thing is that I I don't know, and this is an open question that I have. I've been thinking about it, but I don't know yet. Like, how far can we go to make sure that objects on the on both sides of the fence matches, um, and we preserve this behavior? So, what are the um, the the objects that we do not want to do this this sort of transparency? Um, and it's, it's a little bit tricky there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe in the past we have talked about, well, a random, a, a, uh, they don't now, so the day behavior might not be preserved. Uh, there are some other things that we, I don't know uh, where to draw the line in terms of, okay, those are going to match one to one when yeah. the process so, so, in terms of works and everything else works. Yeah. So so I, then, I think it's, so where where I start from on these things, first of all, let me let me answer the larger question, which is all of this stuff definitely should be uh, included in the topic of uh, virtualizability. Uh, because the membrane is supposed to I mean to supposed to be a major mechanism for virtualizing an entire object graph while imposing a boundary between them. Um, uh, and the issue of uh, avoiding uh, uh, adding new internal slots unless they're very, very carefully thought through with regard to membrane transparency, I think is something to push for. Now, going to the specific, where I start from is that in the naive membrane, if I have a, if, if I have a, Wet, I'm going to go back to the wet versus dry. I don't like inner and outer because it, it, it introduces an asymmetry. Um, uh, if I have, it seems that uh, they, they like better the colors one. Uh, the colors are fine. And yellow. Okay, yeah, let's do colors. Think, at least for communicating with other people in the, in the, in the committee, it seems that the color ones uh, are, okay. are better for them to understand. Okay, let's do colors. Um, if I've got a dry proxy for a wet date, and it's just a simple, oh God, <laughs> if I've got, thank you, wow, oh my God, let's do it Brain, I need a new brain, wow. Um, if I have a yellow proxy for a blue date, um, uh, and it's just the you know, the simplest, naive, identity-preserving, fully transparent membrane, uh, then if I do, for example, date.getFullYear or date.setFullYear or anything where I'm obtaining the method by doing a property lookup on the proxy, then everything works. There's two cases where uh, things don't work which is um, uh, if I do for my, on my own date constructor, date.prototype.getfullyear.call, and then I provide, and I'm on the yellow side, so, I, so I, I do that with the yellow date constructor, and then I apply the, the call to the yellow proxy for the blue date, that will fail. And because of that, the internal slots. Right, because of the internal slots. And Justin's trick, I think, can be where, where, where what we've done on initialization is we've wrapped all of those 
built-ins. It's specifically the built-ins that access an exotic internal slot. It's the only things we need to wrap. Uh, but we wrap all of those built-ins with something that says, is the object on which I would access the internal slot, is it a proxy? And if so, then just do the corresponding instance operation on the proxy. In other words, the yellow get full year method would say, is this a yellow proxy? If so, then obtain a yellow proxy for the blue get full year method, and then apply the yellow proxy for the blue get full year method to the yellow proxy for the date, and then that goes back through the membrane and everything works. So just, just, Justin's trick works for the, um, the use, the direct use of methods through call, which is beautiful. It's, we've never had that before. So my, my compliments yeah. to Justin. Um, yeah. uh, the, the other thing is that, um, is that instance of is broken. If you say um, to, the, to the yellow proxy for the blue date, instance of yellow date constructor, right now it will say no. Yeah, and, and that checks comes in flavors, remember. Now, it's not all the indents are, but people sometimes just get the, the constructor and checks triple equal to the constructor or the date and such. So there are a few things that they might want to double check um, and to, to check for the identity. And all of those, in order to really get them to work, the easiest way is to just remap the proto chain of the of the of the prototype of the proxy, in my opinion, that's easier. Uh, but then, but then it makes it a little bit more difficult the gymnastics of, of remapping to uh, to get the values uh, of the blue date uh, when you're accessing via a yellow prototype method. But I feel it's worth it because imagine that you get the yellow date proxy uh, and you change some, you, you, you add a new uh, intense descriptor or something for some of the methods that you want to invoke. And then inside the, the patch version, you're trying to access the proxy dot something, and that something is already changed on the yellow side of the membrane. There are a bunch of other cases like that, that is, it, it, it makes me a little bit nervous to just go with the dot notation on the proxy. So, uh, so yeah, th this is one of those things where there's, if, you, if, we, if we do what, what the simple form that I suggested, then it's still non-transparent because yellow date proxy dot get full year triple equals yellow get full year uh, in my scheme would necessarily always be false. And yep. that's, and right. that is a visible uh, non-transparency, and uh, I was thinking that that was a non-transparency we'd be willing to live with. Yeah, but because of the other side effects that I explained, I, I'd rather prefer to do the gymnastics uh, of uh, just unwrapping the proxy, getting the, the, the real target out of it, and then call it directly on that target rather than going through the proxy, and then doing all the wrapping and wrapping, because those are things that I have in the membrane very well defined, it's easy to do, it's not a problem. So it's not going to be super, I, I'm planning to work on this. I'm planning to do a proof of concept that this thing works. But okay. uh, then we get into the second question, which is how far do we go? Which ones do we not allow to do this? So I still, having, having code that unwraps and pokes through the membrane, uh, having that scattered through all of the wrappers makes me very nervous, even though it would be one piece of initialization code that sets all of that up. 
So yeah, yeah. no, I, I feel that uh, so definitely a concern. So okay, let me let me clarify. The the code itself, the unwrapping and wrapping that exists already is part of the membrane implementation. These patches are part of the membrane implementation, so we do have access to all that. Not not concerned about that. I do have the concern that in order to preserve everything, you have to pretty much patch the universe, <laughs> not the universe, but all the intrinsics pretty much, because at least all of those that, that, uh, that are using internet slots, and there are a lot of them, we have a list that contains all the accessors. There are not that many, talking about 20 something, not, not that much, but a lot of methods do the same. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 and the I, more they add internal slots, is the more is going to be even bigger problem. Yeah, I, I think if I understand the difference between what Mark was describing, what you're describing, Mark was proposing a sort of a general purpose, uh, uh, a, a wrapper that could be used on all of the all of the internal slot accessing methods of anything, uh, whereas you're proposing basically rewriting each specific thing with a, 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 a no, wrapper that's specific no, I think, no, no, I think it's going to be, in terms of patching, it's going to be the same. You have to patch okay. every single accessor and yeah. method uh, yeah. that use an internal slot with a new one that might be generic enough that you can use the same everywhere. Okay. Hopefully not, but, uh, but you, you, have to, you have to patch them all. You have to and identify the all the places where of this that, might happen. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the implementation will be the same function, most likely, uh, okay. that either does the dot something or does the gymnastics of unwrapping and wrapping and all that. So uh, yeah, my, my main concern is really the quantity, which is going to slow down the initialization of the sandbox, yes. because now, not only doing the initialization, which right now for me is about 10 milliseconds for the yeah. things that we're doing for the full separation, but we're talking about now patching, uh, if not 100, it's close to 100 uh, descriptors yeah, to and patch for, some things. Yeah, and for every one of those methods, you're going to turn one call into three calls. Yes, it's going to slow down everything, yeah. Yeah, three calls in the happy case. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, so I think, we're, I think we're in complete agreement. I really like the shape of this overall uh, scheme that, that Justin suggested. I think we can get much better transparency than I thought was possible. Um, uh, and it makes clear what the cost is of internal slots. Uh, so we should continue to push real hard against the introduction of new ones. Right, in favor, and I believe we have to give them a, a, a uh, hopefully we, we have to give them a, a proper um, option that they can follow. And I, I feel that uh, a data property in many cases is sufficient um, and better, but because they, the data property does not have any issue when it comes to uh, going through the membrane. Right. But we understand that not everything can be a data property. Right. Um, but this thing with promise dot, the, the, the new property they need for the aggregate error of promise dot any, there's really no, no, no interesting functionality that they lose in making that a data property. That's my assumption, yes. And that's my, my, my yeah. Yeah. That's my assumption. Okay. By the way, I will not be able to travel because I'm still uh, here in Cuba, but I, uh, I will try to dial in for, for this conversation. Okay. Um, the, what I had in mind for host virtualizability, it just didn't occur to me and it, uh, that all of these membrane transparency issues are 
virtualizability issues in the same sense that JavaScript is almost perfectly virtualizable. We don't want to lose ground and we want to do what we can to, to gain ground. Um, but uh, in a 30 minute slot, I think both just discussing the membranes and just discussing everything else uh, easily could fill 30 minutes. Um, yep. I think what I'll do is I'll touch on the membrane thing. Uh, and is it too late? Okay, process wise, is it too late to add something to the agenda if it's not asking for stage advancement? I think it's fine. Last time we say it's fine. Um, do you see the promise that any in the agenda? I'm not looking at it, but it is. Uh, if there is, we can probably hijack that one. <laughs> uh, do a search. Search on this page for the for the string promise that any. I, I can't. I think we just suffering from the search thing is just is hidden there. You can move that. Oh, okay. Okay, and then. No, that's easy. No. Um, uh, so just click on this page to make sure the page is the. Oh, I, I, the page then, wasn't in the foreground. That's okay, fine. and now just say promise that on. It looks like it's not on the agenda. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Oh. That's just too clever by half. All right, so we were looking at other things. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, big decimal, I sure hope, has no uh, relevant. Is it had better not? What? I said it had better not. Yeah. Uh, so Dan and I did, did go, I mean, the, the place where there's, so for big decimal itself, I'm, I'm confident that there's no problem there. Uh, for operator overloading, uh, um, uh, Dan and I went through it uh, in some detail. Uh, in quite a long phone call to spot any conflicts with uh, CES issues. And, uh, and, and the answer, first of all, is it seemed fine and it seemed like, he had, like Dan had put in a lot of attention in trying to think that through, but the question still sufficiently complicated that it's something we should be vigilant for as operator overloading goes forward. Okay, uh, unified number format for stage four. Uh, again, I sure hope that there's no um, uh, uh, interaction with CES. Intel.locale, that one uh, already makes me nervous. Does anybody know what is being proposed there? I don't remember. It's fairly well, I might, it's, well, it's obviously fairly well long, but it's going to be stage four. I think it's pretty simple. It might be a, a, a slow leak of uh, non-determinants. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, they uh, I dropped for for a few few seconds. What did I miss? Uh, we're just we're going through the agenda, trying to identify things that are possibly CES relevant other than CES and realms, and we got to Intel dot locale for stage four. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I know that there's potential CES and Realm interactions with Intel.locale. Yes. Yes, but, there is. yes, there is. But I don't remember the details. So the, the local, uh, I believe we clear everything up in the past. Um, this is basically when you are asking for a normalization of a local value. So it is a single argument, the string value of the local, um, th this string value will be parsed, will be identified as a local, and uh, it will return a set of configurations that are uh, defined for that local for, for the current application or for the current realm. And, it, and, and the answer changes over time as I carry my computer between countries. Um, I, I don't. I believe we settle on no. It does oh. not. I believe we settle on that. 
Uh, but I haven't been involved in this for a long time, so I, I would not be able to say from the top I, of my I head. think it changes over time as you change what country you tell your computer to be in. Um, That's what I was asking. So but it changes for a process that's already alive. Uh, so could I, uh, could, mm -hmm. I very mm -hmm. quickly, could I very quickly give uh, some input from the MDN? Um, um, yeah. Uh, so basically, you create a new intel.locale with the locale that you want to know more about. And then it returns an, an object that has um, properties that, um, you know, something like the base name of the locale, the calendar, the case first. So all these, I think, are strings that, um, that basically are, are just used to reflect what you would use in that locale to, to re refer to a particular aspect. So, um, so yeah, yeah. So, so you you create a locale by passing the um, the locale's ID string as the first argument of the constructor, and then it continues on being that that um, identity. It has um, no no right. no geographic manifestations. I guess. Okay, that sounds no, great. Right, but the but the ask the ask here is um, is for example, if you look into, if you click on it and you go into the examples, uh, when you create that object and you ask for local dot hour cycle, for example, which it returns age 20, uh, 24, age 23, age 12, age 11, depending on the configuration of your machine for that locale, uh, you get different values. Mark's question is really, what happens if I keep calling that and I go to my settings and I change the settings and I call it again? Does it give me a new value or continue to give me the value that was uh, internally slotted when the instance was created? And I believe we settled on the idea that once you create an instance, you store all the data associated with that in the instance via an internal slot and then when you interact with that via the accessor, you just get the value that you have in the internal slot. You don't do any extra computation. Good. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's to double to be double checked with CV in the meeting. But I okay. I believe last time that I worked on this, that was the uh, the the agreement uh, on the group that this is this is supposed to be that way. We're not going to. Uh, go and ask the system, cross the boundary of the system to try to find out what the current configuration is. Okay. Intel.segmenter, I assume, has no SES relevance? Does not. Segmenter is just to, um, to produce uh, the uh, comma separator uh, localizable uh, values for any particular set of items, if I remember correctly. Okay. And explicit resource management, uh, the, the, what, what's meant there is what uh, in another one, in scheme, for example, would be called unwind protect. Um, no, 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 it's, it's more this disposable thing. It's the, um, this is the thing where you can um, uh, uh, go into a block of code arranging that um, uh, a rel relevant objects will get their um, dispose or something method called on them if control leaves the that block of code for any reason. And I don't think I see any cess relevance uh, um, uh, there is a uh, explicitness of concurrency issue, which which is you know distantly sets relevant relevant in that it makes reasoning about code reliably harder, and that is the async form of this does have an async keyword, but the async keyword does not in any easy to explain sense, explain where the implied interleaving point is. Right, that discussion now. Okay. 
Um, logical assign, I'm sorry, yeah, I skipped one. Uh, object map crossed out iteration for stage two. Uh, I don't know what this is. Did you look at it? Does anybody know? We can look at it. Oh, uh, yes. So this is just uh, converting dot object dot values, object dot keys, and object dot entries into uh, iterator return type so that it can be used with iterator helpers. It's probably irrelevant. Yeah. Iterators or iterables? Uh, iterators are returned. Okay. All right. Oh, problem, I don't think. Okay. Uh, logical assignment? That is just double pipe equals and ampersand ampersand equals. Oh. Those weren't there before? No, I don't remember this coming up. I must, this must have come up one of the meetings I missed. Was uh, it, it got proposed or was it um, previously found uh, contentious? It says it's asking for stage two, which meant it got past stage one, but there's a low bar for stage one. Um, we were the, waiting on nullish coalescing and optional chaining before seeing if we wanted to move forward. Um, does it also deal with, so, so since we got uh, option, uh, null coalescing, does it also include question, question equals? I do believe so now, but I would have to check the current slides. Okay. Uh, yeah. Either way, um, it's just the logical ops. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I don't know what I think of this from a language design perspective, but it clearly I think does not have any CES relevance. Array filtering. Uh, this is the select reject thing that Justin wanted to rename filter. Oh, okay. Um, uh, once again, I've got opinions, but they're not CES relevant, so I'll hold them back. Um, ah, I think I know what this one is. JSON.parse source text access. Um, uh, right now, there is no way for json.parse to turn a long sequence of digits, you know, something written in JSON number notation. Right. If it's written in JSON number notation, uh, 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 written as an integer, right. uh, and it's really long, there's no... No way to turn it into a big num. There's no way to turn it into... not part of the big integer proposal was to not do that. Yeah. Um, this touches on something that I've been noodling on for a while, which is whether as, as, as essentially the person whose job is to make sure the JSON spec never changes, um, there is some wiggle room in the parser and stringifier for doing things like that. And I'm not sure that this is the way I would choose to do this, but so the, the, J, the JSON spec, as you and Croc remind us of, is the syntax of the JSON right. itself. That's right. This does not change the syntax. That is correct. That is correct. Um, and and so I I I don't remember what, even what I thought of this, but I don't think this is relevant to SAS. I I agree. Um, okay. Uh, SAS is clearly not relevant to SAS. SAS is SAS. Yeah. Okay. Strict built-in functions. Uh, and uh, you know, we can, there's a, there's a separate argument about whether this is the right phrase to describe it. Uh, Alan Wurfsbrock has argued very strongly that we're using the wrong terminology, uh, and I'm happy to shift to whatever terminology can get consensus. Uh, but what this is about is that the um, the existing spec. Uh, talks about um, uh, has some constraints uh, on censoring the 
color and arguments properties of certain functions. Uh, and in the case where it's censored, it, the current spec also says what the censored behavior is. Um, uh, the problem is that the current spec language uh, did not explicitly say what to do about built-in functions. Uh, it, it's kind of written, when, it, 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 when you read it, it's easy to sort of fall into the mindset that functions are either strict or sloppy. And sloppy functions can have a caller and arguments. You know, if you say sloppy function dot caller, sloppy function dot arguments, you can get crazy behavior. Mm -hmm. And the next item, legacy reflection features for JavaScript, is to try to pin down what that crazy behavior is for sloppy functions. Um, uh, for strict functions, uh, there are the following restrictions which is uh, they, uh, in the initial state, they may not have a dot caller or a dot arguments that uh, has those magical properties. Uh, and I think, um, I would have to look again, but I think that we, we ended up specifying that there exists a function dot prototype dot caller and function dot prototype dot, dot arguments as accessor properties that are inherited, and when they're inherited by a strict function, that uh, either of those methods throws. Okay. Furthermore, uh, the dot caller on a sloppy function may not reveal a strict function. In other words, if a strict function calls a sloppy function, while that call is on the stack, if somebody does sloppy function dot caller, it, the, the dot caller magical behavior cannot make available to them the strict function. Okay. And what, um, uh, what Jackworks uh, noticed is that, uh, all of the browser behaviors right now, um, uh, well, sorry, sorry. So, so with phrase that way, talking only about strict functions and sloppy functions, there's something that's not well specified, which is, well, what about built-in functions? So um, what Jackworks did is he tested and found out that all of the browsers were safe in the sense of not revealing built-in functions and not having built-in functions magically reveal something else. Built-in functions behave in this respect as if they were strict functions. Not quite. Oh, not quite. They have the safety, but there are cases where built-in function dot caller will return null, whereas strict function dot caller will throw. And it's just an accident, and it differs between browsers. And some browsers act exactly like what we're asking for, and therefore we know what we're asking for is web compatible. We believe that the divergence is only accidental, so nobody should be nobody should resist. Um, and what we're asking for is that with regard to these issues, that built-in functions act identically to strict functions. So this is yet another case of we've identified a, um, a case of accidental correctness in the spec, which we now want to make explicit. Uh, not quite. So it's not accidental correctness in the spec. It's accidental correctness in the implementations, which we would like to codify in the spec. That's right. That's right. The implementations under, you know, seem to have understood. In fact, there's evidence that at least um, uh, the, um, the people doing V8 uh, actually understood that the purpose of this was to not let strict functions leak by such non-local means. Uh, and the evidence is that the fancy V8 uh, stack introspection API makes a special case to not reveal strict functions and they document it as having made the special case 
in order to preserve what they read in correctly as the purpose of this. Okay. Um, Kate, uh, Mark, um, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, it, I was hoping that we could use the last 30 minutes today to try to settle on the conversation that we have last week uh, about the ROM proposal. So I can okay. uh, provide the update next week. Um, yes. And if, if I, I was hoping that we can do that so we, we can come as a block there and say, this is what we think we should do. And this is the update and get some feedback there. Okay, so, so let me ask the first question that comes to mind. It's probably uh, in front of me on the agenda here. Are you asking for stage advancement? No. Okay, good. Um, uh, because uh, given, um, given where we are, I would be, uh, I'll just say, I would be nervous uh, at the level of commitment uh, that stage three would represent at this point, but I clearly want all of this to advance, clearly. Um, okay, yeah, so... If we, if we, so my, my, my goal is to go give the update, get more people excited about this, and okay. then work toward stage three uh, by updating the spec and uh, so on for the two upcoming meetings. <laughs> Hopefully it will be well when we are at Apple in about two more meetings, but we'll see. Good. Okay, so uh, let's let's go through the issues. I think it's only one issue right now. Uh, one one and a half. Okay. <laughs> the big one is the the hooks. Uh, the whether or not there are hooks that belong to the realm, and if, if true, what are those hooks? Okay, so uh, uh, that's a and the second, and the second one is what is the semantic of the detaching mechanism? Like, uh, okay, how uh, which is sort of a, a really asking how can a realm. Uh, map to host specific operations. Uh. Yeah. So the 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 big thing about the detaching mechanism that uh, I feel very uncomfortable with, uh, and I can and I think I can explain some problematic cases, uh, is the notion that you create it with all you know all the random host connections and then you detach it, as opposed to creating it in a detached state. I think that you should either, you know, I would feel much more comfortable if, if the attachment or detachment was something that you determined at the point that the realm was created, so that a detached realm did not start out attached. If that's the case, then how can you? So I I agree that is in principle is is easier to just have a newly created detached or newly created attached realm. Um, but there is also a third option that is common enough out there, and in fact, this is how. Uh, Node.js does it today. When you create a, a new realm, you want to do certain operations to get it ready, and then you cut it out. Um, because otherwise, getting the detach, if the ultimate goal is to have a detach, uh, creating a detach initially makes it really hard for you to evaluate the code that you want to evaluate there because you don't have the ability to get it ready other than doing a lot of gymnastics to get things evaluated there in a detached um, uh, iframe, uh, a detached realm, which includes maybe even transpiling code to make it a script out of modules and such because you don't have a module system and you require to have a lot of other things that you need in order to initialize that. Um, so 
it seems to me that the real question is if I create a, a realm that is attached by default and I detach it, what are the problems with that? What are the potential problems with that? Rather than asking uh, uh, whether or not we wanted to have a create a detach, uh, create a new realm detached already. I feel that the, the question, you're saying that you feel com uncomfortable with it, but really what is the problem of detaching if you can guarantee that when you detach, nothing else will cause it IO from that realm? What is the problem with that? Okay. So um, I, I think the two questions are tied together. And I actually went through the spec. I should find the document. I went through the spec recently looking for all occurrences of the word host and all occurrences of the phrase uh, implementation dependent and implementation defined to try to gather a sense of what all of the host hooks actually are because um, uh, many, of, many of them do not have the word host in the name. And I'm sure that that methodology missed several because there's, there hasn't been anything, um, uh, you know, any convention we've tried to enforce there. Um, but uh, let, me, let me actually bring that up on my computer and see if there's some that need to be associated with the realm because the main problem I have with detaching late has to do with the inheritance of uh, of realm of host of you know, host through the realm in a grand a, a, a grandchild attached realm. In other words, let me let me just talk talk through the example and then I'll take a look. If a uh, if realm a creates realm b, um, uh, providing. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, uh, it's probably, probably awkward to ask this question before I have the hooks, but assuming we do need hooks at the realm level, would you provide those in constructing a realm or would you provide those in detaching a realm? Right, that's a, that's a great question. This is, I was asking this question myself and this is, where I get to a point where I was considering, and I'm still considering, that what we want is not really a, let, let me give you the, the full story quickly. Um, okay. I believe what we want is not a detachable realm. What we want is a detachable mechanism at the evaluator level. Let me let me get to why. Uh, if the if the realm does not have any hook, and the realm is just trying to figure out at the time of the creation of the realm, uh, who is the provider of the host specific uh, uh, hooks, which I, I I keep thinking that should be the evaluator around the realm, so the evaluator that uh, enables the realm to have access to the specific host uh, mechanisms that are required by the, by the realm to function. Um, it is a, a pr property of the evaluator to decide that how to resolve these hooks when the realm attempts to use it and therefore the evaluator itself can decide to replace them or to make them throw errors or to just simply make them no ops and sort of imitates the same that happens today when it comes to uh, connecting an iframe and detaching it from the, from the DOM. Uh, it's sort of this equivalent mechanism. It's not really about the realm itself, it's whoever provides those hooks for the realm to function. And then it becomes like, okay, well, the realm is not really detached. The realm doesn't know anything about any, any of that. It only knows that 
someone is providing these hooks. And when it needs them, it goes and asks uh, that piece of uh, the puzzle to do some operations. And if you create a realm inside this other realm, the same thing applies. It's not about uh, this child realm to ask to the pattern realm for anything. It's really about uh, the context in which this child realm was created and what is the nearest host provider, um, which in this case should be, a, so in, my, in my mind, continues to be an evaluator. That's so, sort of where I'm leaning toward. Uh, okay. but let me just reiterate, no hooks at the round level, no detach at the round level, and move everything to the evaluator. Wait, I'm sorry, I, 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 I um, no detach at the round, okay. Um, the, the, I, I missed something in the longer explanation then, because I was, I was hearing the part about no hooks at the realm level. Um, I missed the part about no detach at the realm level. Can you go through that again? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, my connection sucks. Uh, okay, so the, what made me think about this was effectively your questions last week, and you were talking about, okay, well, you detach. But what if what I want instead is to give you uh, a new set of hooks, a new yeah. set of host specific functionalities, go and use those. Don't use the ones provided by the outer realm or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think that really is not a, 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 a quality of the realm to try to detach and give you the proper mechanism to um, provide alternative implementations of those hosts because we know for sure that some of these host specific uh, behavior will be defined at the evaluator level. But if you detach the realm itself, then the realm has to give you a, a, a mechanism for you to provide those things because it's not going to be attached to anything. It's going to be completely detached and now you have to figure out what to do there to resolve something from the host. And, and that was what, what clicks for me. Uh, it's like, okay, well, the realm is really about the intrinsic. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything about, it, it doesn't have knowledge about the, the hooks and how to provide whether are the host specific ones or, or the, the ones defined by the creator of the realm and such. And I, try to move everything one level up to the evaluator saying, when a realm is created, the only operation that the realm needs to go through is to find out what is the proper evaluator that provides the host specific behaviors. Um, and the realm itself is never really detached. It's just this thing in memory that has the intrinsics and is somehow connected to an evaluator. And so, I, I, so, want that. so 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 let, so let's walk through let's walk this through with regard to my um, example hook, uh, keeping in mind that it's a completely unrealistic example, but just to understand. Uh, or uh, what we might want to do first is everything I'm about to say disappears if there it does not actually need to be a hook at the realm level. So I found my hook document, and Chip can easily navigate to it. Go back to the CES topic, it's actually linked to from CES. And everybody can still see Chip's screen, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, this one over here, refactor spec approach, that MD, and go to the bottom of this page. Okay, the random notes section is where I accumulated um, the all of the things that seemed like at least, uh, you know, all of the behavior that or semantics that was coming from the host. Um, so, uh, okay. So, uh, uh, initialize host defined realm. Uh, that's the thing that that's mo mostly that's the thing that creates the intrinsics. So that basically becomes the realm API. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, host report errors, as I say in the comment here, is probably something for which we want to hook it neither at the evaluator nor at the realm level. 
but because it's about turn boundaries, uh, it wants to be hooked at the agent level because the because because the promise scheduling is agent wide. Okay, uh, host ensure can compile strings and host has source text available. Both of those are obviously about the evaluator, not the realm. Uh, run jobs again would be at the agent level. Uh, promise rejection cracker would be the agent level. Um, uh, debugger actually kind of surprised me, um, which is uh, the debugger expression uh, returns a value determined by the host. The host can provide some value yep. other than undefined. I didn't know that. Um, yes, they all return undefined, however. We looked at this when we were proposing debugger operands. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so somehow I missed all that. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it affects, well, no, if, if we wanted to provide a hook for that, which conceivably we might do, it would clearly be at the evaluator level. Um, uh, direct to prologues, again, evaluator, um, detach array buffer. I don't know where it would go, but it clearly would not go on the realm, so we can skip it in this conversation. Uh, there's this bizarre phrase in the proxy internals, which seems to me that, that it's, it's completely contra contradicts the, um, I mean, it's about a condition that should be impossible. Uh, ECMAScript implementation must be robust in the presence of all possible invariant violations. There shouldn't be any invariant violations, um, but since it's a belt and suspenders kind of thing, I'm not sure that I want to ask for it to be removed either. Um, uh, global object is uh, clearly about compartments and such, not about realms. Uh, URI handling. Uh, yeah, there's a strange, yeah, um, there's the strange phrase in the spec that says many implementations of ECMAScript provide additional functions and methods that manipulate web pages. What the hell is it talking about? <laughs> um, I believe these are kind of, this text should probably be removed from the spec. It's probably there for a legacy reason. Um, there are a few things still remaining that aren't in the spec and are no longer compatible across environments because of Internet of Things or server-side JavaScript. Um, this seems to have historically been about the encode URI stuff, and then the things that we didn't get in ECMA 262, such as A to B and B to A. Um, this okay. should probably just be removed spec text, honestly. Okay, okay. Um, uh, to locale, uh, okay, so, okay, uh, to locale is an interesting one. It actually is a, um, Actually, it is like the date example. The date example is going to be my unrealistic example. Um, uh, maybe to locale is unrealistic in the same way, but to locale is a behavior of the, of the intrinsics. Date giving you access to the current time is a behavior of the intrinsics. Uh, likewise, uh, math.random. Um, so, uh, the, the reason why these three things are not pressing is that if you want to censor them or virtualize them, uh, you can do that by modifying the intrinsics after they're created and before you allow other code to execute. Uh, so they're not urgent. But if you did want to handle them in a principled um, uh, you know, API supported manner, then all of these I.O. abilities inside the uh, I.O. or mutability abilities inside the intrinsic set um, uh, should be, you know, those would be realm level hooks, not evaluator level hooks. Um, uh, so let's assume for a second that uh, we, move, we decide to move them to the evaluator for whatever reason. Um, uh, where you want to have control over a, 
piece of code that you are going to do. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a row. No, no. The, the problem is it's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with the code being evaluated. It has to do with the call behavior of the objects, which cannot depend on what code calls it. I didn't get that. I didn't get that either. Okay. One of the principles that we've been holding to rigorously, in this case without exception, um, is that the behavior of a callee only depends on what is passed to it. I, I, I'm not, that's not the part I didn't understand. Okay. What I didn't understand is why is there, what is the issue with, in this specific case? Oh, two locale. Um, uh, I think that the, the, the two locale referred to there uh, 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 is sensitive to the current locale. Okay. Uh, in which case it's mutable and IO. Okay. And you would want, and it comes from the host. Okay. So when you create a new set of intrinsics, you might want to create the intrinsics so that within that realm, they seem to be elsewhere. You know, they just provided a, provided a, uh, a, a locale such that they're, you know, they're in Paris or something. Right. And, and, um, uh, and so since it's the behavior of the two locale function. I see. So this, this has to do with the fact that the, it, the, the intrinsics are at realm granularity. Right. And therefore, this, because this is associated with intrinsics, it's associated with the realm as opposed to, well, why can't you just have one for every... Uh, right. But, but uh, I'm, so... I see the issue, I think. So, so Mark, the, the, my mental model here is that the realm, when created, it has to go and find out certain things. And let's assume that for some of these APIs, the realm has to find out what is the, the locale for the realm when, when being created. So intrinsics in that realm are associated to it uh, or has this information built in somehow. Um, that uh, those intrinsics will no longer have to go and do the I/O because they already know what the what the locale is or something like that. Uh, even that operation during the creation of the realm can be found out by going into the host and asking, "Hey, what is the current locale that you are using?" So I can create intrinsics and get them to be ready. So when you call the two. So, so, okay, the part that, but what you, so if they're going to the actual host, then we haven't virtualized the host. So, right, um, right. I, I, so, but, but uh, the, what I'm saying is that the, the realm, when being created, it has the ability to go and find out something from someone who is going to provide the, the proper uh, mechanism to resolve that value. And that yeah. thing does, does not necessarily have to be. Uh, the, the, the host as it is today could be the virtualization of the host via an evaluator. Okay, so the, so, the, uh, so I agreed with everything except the last word. Um, and it's not that I'm disagreeing, it's that I'm, I don't understand. Um, the realm constructor is shared by all of the evaluators in that realm. Um, if there was a realm constructor per evaluator, the way there's an eval function per evaluator, then I think I would understand what you're saying. But there's a shared realm constructor realm wide, so its behavior cannot have any dependency on what evaluate as for, on from what evaluator was it called. So where would it go to find the JavaScript code that acted like its host hooks? Yeah, uh, and this is, uh, I haven't think about that far because this, that's on the realm of the evaluator for me. Like, okay, well, uh, somehow. Uh, the evaluator cannot to... affect the behavior of objects that are called from the code being evaluated. Right, right, right. So I, I, I'm okay. I, I, what I'm saying is that uh, I haven't think about this problem space 
uh, from the perspective of the evaluator. And maybe you're right, maybe the ROM is something that is also controlled by the parameterized evaluator, just like function, capital function, capital okay, cool function. And, when and, when so. and how are the host hooks determined? That, yes, that is, the, that is the question. Right. Um, and they have to be, for, for things like locale, random, and date, which is so far three examples, mm -hmm. they have to be determined um, before normal code starts running in that realm. And, and the reason I put it that way is that the code that is determining it can, you know, practically today does mm -hmm. determine it by monkey patching the primordials. Uh, and that's still a practical option, which is why we haven't found a do or die example yet. Um, but the more natural thing is that they're determined when the intrinsics are created. With regard to the normal code running in the realm, all, what they see is that they're determined when the intrinsics were created because they're never able to observe the state before they're fixed. Right. But so I may be I may be barking up completely the wrong tree here, but my thinking is the code that creates a realm mm -hmm. or a compartment itself is running in some evaluator. Doesn't matter. It's doing it by calling new realm on some realm constructor. And the behavior of that realm constructor can only depend on what's passed to it. It, it, cannot can't, it can't be pulling it out of the realm that it's constructed from because then it would just be ambient hoo-ha and we don't want that. That's right. Got it. Got it. Okay. Fair point. So if right. so what we've by, been by doing making it by making by making it a realm um, uh, to be controlled by the evaluator, then there is no problem with the evaluator providing these capabilities. Uh, if the realm, cons if you had a realm constructor, I mean, the, when you say pro the evaluator providing the capabilities, uh, I, th I think I don't know what you mean, so I should ask you to expand. Right, just, just what you were about to say. The, the evaluator provides the constructor for the realm, for okay. any code that runs inside that evaluator. Okay, yeah, if, if when you make a new compartment, uh, the evaluator is becoming compartment, uh, if when you make a new compartment, um, uh, I'm sorry, when you make a new compartment, uh, what we've been doing is um, uh, we've been giving each new compartment a new eval function, a new function constructor, and a new compartment constructor. Right. If we also give it a new realm constructor, then like the compartment constructor, the behavior of the realm is specific to the value to the compartment that was created. Mm -hmm. So if you provided uh, hooks on the creation of the evaluator that determined the behavior of the realm constructor that it was creating to populate its global, that would solve mm -hmm. the problem. Okay. And if you're running in in excess, you get a realm creator that just throws. That's right. That's right. Actually, actually in excess, what I would do is just not have there be a realm create a realm constructor. I think that's the cleanest thing. Is that if you're in, if you're on a machine that does not support multiple realms, there simply is no realm constructor. I could argue either and side. And the reason that. why okay. I feel that first net race. Right? And the reason why I, I feel that this is a more uh, compelling story, uh, there are a couple of reasons there. The first one is simplicity, because now uh, the realm is really about the intrinsics and is a, uh, a more uh, simple proposal. Uh, it doesn't have any specific detaching mechanism. It doesn't have any of that. It's just about creating intrinsics and giving you what, what you're supposed to use for evaluating code and such. Um, so simplicity is always welcome in this, in this case. Um, the second one is that as a JavaScript author now, 
uh, I understand exactly where I need to look if I want to virtualize anything. I know it's the evaluator, the one that give me all these tools for me to control the evaluation with a bunch of uh, rules, of course, uh, but uh, invariants in general that we, we might be able to put inside the evaluator, like for example, what happened if I create two realms and uh, when the realm calls the hook, what is the value of the locale that it produces and something like that. Uh, we, we could do a lot of things at the evaluator level that I feel that are more compelling to have it in one single place than having it scatter through the realm, the evaluator, the agent and such. Uh, it's going to be a lot more complicated for people to understand what's going on and find the right spot to do the things that they wanted to do. Uh, that's, for me, those are the, 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 the two component stories uh, that I feel that we could communicate that and say, the realm is really about the intrinsics. I'm finding this plausible. Uh, and your thing, and the thing that you said about not even doing a detach at the realm level, um, I'm also finding plausible, and in fact, very much fits with uh, JF's latest convention. JF is still not on the call, correct? No. Okay. So uh, JF, um, I think, solved the compartment startup uh, um, uh, question uh, very, very elegantly and with a very minimal API, uh, which is a method on realm. So, but it's a method, it's a static method on the realm constructor. Um, uh, and uh, so there's still a, 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 you know, a bridge between the two proposals, but uh, what lockdown does is it um, uh, it it turns the realm that it's already in into a CES realm, uh, and it creates a compartment API for creating new compartments in that realm. Yeah, and you have to replace the realm anyways. Yeah, you have to replace the the, the realm constructor to add something to it. Uh, the so the, the compartment constructor um, would be would would itself not be on the realm API. The lockdown method would be a static on the realm constructor. Oh. Um, but the realm constructor would be made and added to the global um, once the the intrinsics have been made safe. So lockdown does take a realm that's already instantiated, that you're already running in, and it turns it into one which is safe. So for example, it um, by default uh, makes date.now inactive. Um, by default, it makes math.random inactive. And lockdown has options parameters so you can, you can configure that, but, but the default is safe. Right, you have to, to use yeah, options to deviate from safe. Uh, but so here's you're, the you're saying that safe alternatives. Yes. Yeah. The well, how the option, whether the options sim are boolean, and then you provide the safe alternative by monkey patching, uh, or whether the option is the means by which you provide the safe alternative is TBD. Right. Um, but, right. but but you're saying, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that. Uh, this matches better because now it's really about simply knowing what realm is doing some operations and whether that realm is already locked down and the evaluator can just control what is the response for any operation that this realm is asking for. Yeah, yeah. and the fact that it's locking it down from the inside means that uh, there's nothing cross realm in the semantics of lockdown. Uh, and that was, I think, the mistake right. that all these previous versions of realm and CES were making is that in order to create a CES safe realm, you had to create it from another realm, which means that you could not avoid cross realm issues. 
But here's the issue with lockdown that, that fits exactly with what Caridi is saying with regard to no detach. I was going to say, this sounds a lot like detach. So it's so here so so it's not so here's the thing that J, JF invented that really took me by surprise and works beautifully is that the host objects on the original global the global that you're running those host objects remain on the global after the lockdown operation so you've made the thing cess safe in the sense that the language now obeys object capability rules um, but, uh, and that all the, all the shared intrinsics are, are transitively frozen and made safe before they're transitively frozen, uh, and that you now have a compartment constructor for making compartments. But now that the language is cess safe, the, your continued execution is as if continued execution in what is now a root compartment. And the root compartment is populated. The root compartment is, is endowed with all of the all of the host objects. The host objects. On, on, these are the actual host objects that the actual host okay. created that's, in creating the realm. That's one of those obvious in retrospect. Right, which which fits with Caridi's attached realm, which is it just gets all this crap from the host. Uh, and then the really cool thing is, well, now that it's locked down, there is a compartment constructor. When you make a new compartment, the new compartment, its globals are only populated with the safe globals plus the per compartment eval function compartment and now realm constructors uh, and the endowments that you explicitly passed in when you said new compartment. So now the code running in the compartment uh, cannot tell that the endowments that you passed to it were not actual host objects. So it fits with the host virtualizability um, that you're now running the same way that you would have run on a genuine host after the lockdown point. But you're now running with apparent host objects that were determined by other code. So the ability to create a isolated compartment, one that doesn't inherit any of the host objects from the parent global, is, I think, fits exactly the uh, Caridi's description of doing a detach at the evaluator level rather than the realm level. Caridi, did that seem right? Yep. Great. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, do you want to continue with the list just in case there's something pops? Yeah, but I... yeah, let's do that. Um, uh, so there is this bizarre statement in the list that bigint.prototype.toString is implementation dependent. That cannot possibly make sense, uh, but it doesn't affect us, so I'll go on. Um, uh, the precise algorithms um, uh, done by, you know, what, what the precise rounding, round off error is by, you know, math.sign, for example, is actually said implementation dependent, but the, the spec actually has a note recommending that you just, that, that implementation should just adopt uh, exactly the round off produced by, the, by that particular C library, which is in common use. I do not know the degree to which actual implementations uh, um, uh, obey that suggestion. Um, yeah, uh, we do the same for 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 the uh, internationalization, where we recommend to use ICU uh, okay. library. Good, good. And in the case of ICU, does everybody take up your suggestion? Uh, now, yes. Okay, great. Do you know what the in issue the past, is? It was it was only Microsoft the one who was using their own internal implementation that was bigger than ICU, and huh. now they moved to Chromium, so. Okay, and do you know what the situation is with round off error of the operations on math? No. Okay, um, local TZA, that's a time zone thing, right? Yes. Okay, uh, so that would be in the same category as, as current time and, and locale and such. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, okay. So um, they thought. Which, parts... by the way, by, by by the way, Mark, I don't think in uh, this is uh, a provision during the creation of the realm. I believe it's just used the first time that we are about to use some of these operations, but I might be wrong. I think that they, it's. We don't, we don't recommend when to do it. We just de define what it should do, but we don't recommend when to do it. And implementation most likely do not do it during the creation of the realm. Okay, but it's still information that has to come from the host because the language doesn't yes. know what time zone is at. Right, right. But at the time we introduce, by the time we, we get to introduce the evaluator, we might, be, we might need to define this correctly because otherwise it will be ah. an observable difference. Right, right, right. It still has to be in the behavior of the intrinsic, um, which means it has to be determined, well, the behavior has to be determined when the intrinsics are created. Um, yep. Okay. Um, I think we're fine. Uh, um, uh, all of the other ones are spec non-determinism determinism issues rather than host provided behavior issues. Except for all document.all, but I do not care if we cannot virtualize document.all. <laughs> and we do. That one is one of those that we can virtualize because you can you could replace. Uh, the behavior of it today. No, no, the JavaScript code cannot emulate the behavior of document at all. No, I mean, uh, VI membrane, we, we, could, we could replace it just fine. Uh, a membrane cannot be transparent on that one. Membrane cannot emulate the behavior of document at all. Okay. Well, if, if the behavior of document are all is host dependent, it's not. It's 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 it's. Oh, I'm sorry. It is, but all of the browser hosts do the same thing, and nobody else has any document. Right, but is this is this in conformance with like a W three C spec, or is it just they all happen to do the same thing? Uh, we actually have a loophole in the ECMAScript spec that says specifically for the object named document.all, it's allowed to behave as follows. And then we specify the behavior. Um, and we, we specify that nothing else can have that bizarre behavior. So I, never just looked at, I never looked at the spec of that. Is it suspected that it may have this bizarre behavior or it must have this? May. Well, then, then if you virtualize it so it doesn't have the bizarre behavior and it's you know, not even trans it transparent and it's virtualized, you're still compliant. You're still compliant, but you're, fa you're failing to, so, so on Node, if you're trying yeah, to you, emulate you being a broader browser. You can't transparently virtualize. Right. And for this one, I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Dr. Kurtz, when I do this. Yeah. Yeah, okay. this is this is such an abomination, um, uh, but we didn't have a choice at the time. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so, so, so already ha having gone through the list and not found any pain points, uh, I think I think I'm going to go ahead and provisionally agree with your position. Okay. So I can go ahead and. Uh, prepare the presentation for next week, um, stating that uh, we're simplifying the realm. Uh, I don't think we have to make big changes to the spec with the realm proposal because those will happen once the evaluator appears. Uh, that at yeah. that point we'll have to formalize all these uh, all all these different hooks, and we'll have to change the the or at least define how the realm is constructed and all the things that needs to happen during the construction. 
those could be deferred for the evaluator. Uh, we don't have to do it now. And I think it's going to be uh, uh, simple to get to stage three after that because there's nothing really there. Um, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see, but I'm, um, I'm, 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 I'm feeling optimistic about, about at least getting the, the, one of the primary pieces in, in browser soon, we'll see. Then the last yeah. thing that needs to be defined is whether or not, what will be the API that you will feel more comfortable with for evaluating code inside the realm, whether that's going to be evaluate source or evaluate scripts or evaluate module or evaluate program or evaluate expression. We never really settle on what, what kind of APIs the realm should provide. Yeah. The, and and I, think, I think the right way to think about that is the, the realm simply provides access to the evaluator and then it's the evaluator that you ask to evaluate code. I mean, the, the separation is clean exactly because the realm is not concerned with evaluation. But the, evalu the evaluator is one of the constructors that's created uh, as part of creating a new set of intrinsics. Uh, right, no, but I'm talking about so once we have the evaluator, yes, you will be able to create one of those. I'm talking about the realm itself. Uh, before we have the evaluator, we have to provide some, we talk about something called like a default evaluator or something like that, like a dummy evaluator. So the realm comes with something that allow me to evaluate some code there. Aside from the eval function, uh, do we want to provide, um, more sugar on top of that, or do we want to just give them something very straightforward, very simple that allowed them to evaluate the scripts and modules and seems that fine, that, that th those are the two that we might be able to go after. Uh, just two simple functions that we just call and, and, and evaluate code inside that realm. What if it was just one uh, and it was a, uh, a script evaluator that only evaluated scripts in strict code as global code. I'm sorry, as strict code as eval code, not as global code. Uh, in other words, it corresponds to uh, the the normal eval function, except that it's strict. But the but the eval function, once made strict, is evaluating code as eval code. Uh, it's not evaluating code as global code. And what that means is that um, any top level var or function declarations uh, do not leak into the global object. They're just self-contained inside so the why script. Do you script. Why are you, uh, so how can I evaluate something in sloppy mode there then? That's question number one. Question number two is like, uh, I was under the assumption that one of the use cases of the realm is to be able to work as the foundation for the node VM module, like, Literally, we could go into the no VM and change the guts of it to use the ROM instead of what they're doing today. Okay, the, they're the, going the, straight into VA. Okay, so so I'm, I'm, I, I was making an assumption that I didn't state that the purpose of whatever evaluation method we're talking about is just to evaluate something trivial as a bootstrap, uh, so that you've got an initial thing that's evaluating in the realm that can then use the in the realm evaluator to evaluate anything else. Well, in Node today, when you create a VM, you can evaluate uh, scripts, you can evaluate modules as well. It has a single API, but it has an option saying, 
this is a type module evaluation. Right, and but, that, but all of those are knobs on evaluation. And as I understand it, what you're trying to do with the Realm API is make it only about creating a set of intrinsics and then delegating all issues of evaluation to a separate evaluator API. Right, but we'll have a, we'll have a, a time be, in between the Realm API being approved and implemented uh, to the time where the evaluator is implemented, where you have a, a parameterized evaluator that can do all kinds of things. But in the meantime, you let's need to not have a let's way not do a let's not do a kludge because we expect there to be a window of a few months between approving one proposal and another. Okay, so once we go next week, uh, we can say uh, that we are the realms about intrinsic. We're not giving any evaluation mechanism other than. Uh, the in, in the the intrinsic eval that you can take out of it and use it as you want. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that and that eval, of course, is giving you a sloppy script evaluator that evals the code as eval code. And mm -hmm. for a bootstrap mechanism, that's a fine place to start. Okay. All right, so that's all I need. Anything else? That was amazing. We'll see how that works. <laughs> yeah, so that was really amazing. And the thing that you read, the, the membrane discussion building on Justin's insight was also amazing. With membranes can be much more transparent than I had any idea. Yeah, I have to, I have to work toward that goal, uh, proof of concept and see um, how, how, how much complexity does it add and the overhead, but hopefully we can get people to start understanding that internal slots are a problem. Yes, this is it's Justin Ridgewell. Is that the Justin? Hang on a second. I guess. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so great. I don't have the background. Okay, we're well over time. We had an amazing conversation. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. So much. Right. Bye. Bye. It's, it's creating a false source type you know, function with these parameters.